We're going to go ahead and get started. So um, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming. Um, Josh, unfortunately, um, the, the, the Dr. Good was unable to come this morning. He had a conflict, so I will just be stepping in to introduce everybody. Um, and kind of orient you to the next couple of hours. So um, this is part of the first year extended orientation. And um, this was brought about because we got feedback from the students that getting everything all in that first day or week of orientation was a little much to hold on to to be able to use that information moving forward. And also that there weren't a ton of opportunities throughout the year for new students to get together and see people from other departments, meet other faculty. Um, so, we're, so we're trying this the first year. Um, so we um, hope that you enjoy this next couple hours and we'll welcome your feedback about what you liked and what you think we should do for next year and what else you might need. Um, so today we're focusing on advising and mentoring. And so um, I will let each of the faculty members introduce themselves. So we're doing this um, in two parts. So the first part, um, we're going to hear from the faculty. And then in the second part, we'll have um, some lunch and we'll have some staff and students. Um, because as a student here, um, it's not realistic to think that your advisor will be your everything. So um, we want to introduce you to some staff and some other students and hear from them about how they put together the mentoring advising relationships that they needed to achieve their goals that might spark some thoughts and ideas from you. So um, we, you have in front of you a little worksheet that you can use to take some notes as we work through these couple hours and as you move forward. Um, you will also see uh, um, a little handout that uh, was created um, that gives you uh, kind of some ideas of all the resources that are available to you, not just here at CGU, but also across the consortium that you're encouraged to take part in. And then we also have some faculty advising guidelines that um, are on that one sheet. So you can see what the faculty have of um, the faculty and staff um, are um, ready to, to provide to you. So I'm going to let the uh, faculty introduce themselves. And then we'll start with just two questions. So the first question is if you could talk about um, an experience or a challenge that you may have had when you were a grad student and how somebody who was an advisor or mentor to you may have helped you through it. And then, um, so if you could talk about that briefly, and then also if you have a couple of tips, um, you know, maybe one or two things that these are all first year students that you would encourage them to um, be excited about or pursue. Do you want us to introduce ourselves and then answer your questions or okay. Hi, I'm Jean Shardell. I am a professor in political science. I've been here for 25 years. I teach classes in American politics. My current research interest and passion, if you will, is voting rights, particularly voting rights with respect to Native Americans who tend to be the forgotten group. Okay. My name is Jason Siegel. I'm an associate professor over in uh, psychology. I've been here uh, 12 years or so. Uh, my research looks at how we can take psychological theorizing and apply it to the health domain with the goal of helping people traditionally. I have a couple of grants where we're looking at organ donation. I also do a lot of research on depression. How do you persuade someone with depression to seek help? where the worse and worse they get, the less likely they are to go forward. Hi, I'm David Nagel. I'm a professor of art theory and history in the art department in the School of Arts and Humanities. I um, teach um, a writing course and a survey course, and also meet with students individually in their studios, which constitutes the, the core of our work in the art department. That's what I'm meeting. Hi, I'm Linda Perkins, and I'm an associate university professor, which means that I'm transdisciplinary. I'm located in two different schools at the university. I'm in arts and humanities, where I direct our applied women's studies program, and also direct uh, a women and gender studies certificate program, which I would encourage people who are interested in any topics on gender. It's just a program that you add on to your doctoral program. And I also teach in the School of Educational Studies, where I'm in higher education, I'm a historian, and I my research is on the history of black women's higher education, the history of black students in elite schools, and the history of talent identification programs, basically. And I teach classes, though. I teach a class on gender and education. I teach a class, history of American higher education, and then I teach uh, a class um, 
for incoming women's studies students applied women's studies. Do you want me to start? I think okay, so we're just kind of going down the roll. Um, when I think about this, when I went to graduate school, I was older. I did go to college out of high school. I went to work in a garment factory, and then I went into a truck plant and raised a family while going eventually to school at nights. And I have never, I've never known people who had much education. I didn't come from people with that background. And so I went to school at nights while building trucks. And, when it, and I didn't go and get advice through my undergrad. I was in a big university. And I got admitted to MIT, which is pretty amazing. Uh, I'm not going to pretend it wasn't. And when I got there, um, my incoming class, the students who came in, not only were they younger than me, they were people who had gone to fairly traditional backgrounds and to prestige universities. And I discovered that um, I didn't know how to perform in those settings. So I would be in classes and there would be words that I had read, but I had never heard. So for example, paradigm. I said paradigm. And everybody laughed at me. And I was silenced. I mean, I didn't speak again. Yeah, most of my first year, I didn't speak after that. And I didn't go ask for help. And I probably should have. But at the university I was at, you would have to wait two months to see your advisor. Um, and yeah, it was a, you know, your advisor was up here and you were down there. And people were terrified of their advisors. And I didn't ask for help. I never asked for help. They didn't have a writing center. They didn't have any of those kinds of things. And I think the lesson that I come away with, um, by the way, I did end up being successful. But um, <laughs> just for the record, uh, is you know take advantage of the opportunities. And the other thing is, yeah, take advantage of the faculty. Um, not in a gross way, but we're here to help you. Um, most of us are very available. Um, I know my unit. We have a sort of open door rule. We have office hours. But we also, and I, I will tell people, if you're around and you see my door open, pop in. But respect us. If the door is closed, only in an emergency, knock. Because, you know, we have other work. But by and large, we're very, very accessible to help you with. I suspect if I had actually gone to my advisor, he would have helped me. I turned out later I realized he was actually a very shy man. Um, he probably would have, but it was just, oh God, you know, it's like God. So. Hi. Um, okay, challenge. I can say with some certainty that where you are now is better than where I was when I was in your place. During midterm week, I was in the mental hospital in Tucson. Um, I had to admit myself, suicide ideation, missed my entire week of midterms fighting depression. Hasn't gone away, got through my first semester, got through my second semester, got a PhD, got tenure. Um, so unless you're with in a, in a mental institution, which you're not right now because I can see you, <laughs> you are ahead of me. <laughs> and if you can very much be you know successful. I, I think a key thing is everyone's struggling. I we've done some focus groups on this, and a lot of people go around with, oh, I didn't sleep for five nights in a row as a badge of courage. It's not. Yes. It is a sign of something going wrong. And when it comes to where your advisor is helpful to you, I would have dropped out. I basically went to my advisor and said, I am done. I cannot think, I cannot sleep, 
and he said, you realize you are fighting depression and possibly need to be hospitalized. I went to another advisor and I said, you know, so I got hospitalized for a week. I thought I have to drop out of school. The advisor who put me there as one of my professors says, no, stay in. I went to the second one and I said, clearly I can't do two classes. There's no way. And he said, eh, I think you could. And I said, no, 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 I, I can't. Drop me. No, I'll give you an incomplete. Stay in my class. Come whenever you want to. I'll give you an incomplete on the last day of school. Pass them both. Um, and I only, you know, I, I say this because, one, if you're struggling, please go and seek that. <coughs> whether it's through Mansoor, whether you go to your professor, whether you talk to other classmates, do so. <coughs> there is no badge of honor of fighting through this alone. If you have a broken leg, you are lacking intelligence if you try to run that marathon without the broken leg. Those of you who have glasses, like myself, it would be, there would be no, uh, Jason, what's wrong? Well, I've had a headache. I've been reading without my glasses all day. Why? I don't know. I, I feel more manly if I don't wear glasses. I'm stronger. It's ridiculous. So if you need help, go to Mansoor, let them know it's an emergency, and they will see you right away. A. B. No matter how your first semester starts, it is not predictive of where you're going to end up. There is no or very little relationship between who is kicking tail at midterms, who is struggling, and who's walking with their degree and publishing 50, 90 articles a few years later. So just because you may not be towards the front of the race doesn't mean you're not going to be when the semester's over. My best advice between seeing Mansoor, just to you know, repeat what my great colleague to my right said, talk to us. If we did not like working with students, we would have picked a different career. My meetings with my students, and I know I'm not alone, or what I look forward to. Okay, from 8 to 12.30, I have to take care of this, take care of, oh, good, 1 to 2, I'm meeting with so-and-so. That is the highlight of our day often. So if you don't come to us, in a way, you're not taking advantage. You're taking one of our great joys away from us. And it just makes so little sense. So let us help you. If you don't want to come to us, your upperclassmen are a phenomenal source. Trust them. They have no reason to lie to you. So almost look at extreme, go to Mansoor. If not, come to us. If either of those options aren't something you're okay dealing with, talk to classmates. But please don't give up and don't think that any struggles is predictive of anything at all, because it's not. Um, when I was in graduate school, I was pretty unadvisable, and I, uh, I didn't look to the professors there for um, career advice or life advice or any kind of guidance in that. I was like a, a pretty dyed-in-the-wool nerd, and I wanted to talk about um, books and pictures and things I read and things I looked at, and, and really um, use my professors in in that way, which for me was ex exciting and thrilling and enriching and that could maybe a, a, a more interesting person and that certainly made my life more interesting. But I um, was just entirely unequipped for thinking about what I was doing in graduate school in terms of a, of a career. And I didn't use the people there at all. Part of that may have been I was in a PhD program in art history and really quickly I discovered that I didn't really care about history. I cared about art. And I felt that I was really being trained to be a professional historian who just happened to look at um, paintings and sculptures. So I left after a, a couple years um, and um, just decided I would move to Los Angeles and become an, an art critic. Uh, and that's what, that's what I, I did. And uh, little by little it, it turned out OK. But it probably goes back to my undergraduate um, advising, where I, I didn't, I also didn't take advantage of my uh, professors, and I, um, you know, again, I, I looked to them for ideas, but couldn't even think about turning it towards a, a job or a career or a, a life in the world that pays pays health insurance. Um, the only advice I took was when I was applying for. Uh, 
graduate school, um, so as an undergrad, I did, um, in 1985, I graduated with a degree in, in modern thought and literature. So like the heyday of, before they did, I think they called it interdisciplinary, here they call it transdisciplinary. Um, and one of my uh, favorite teachers said, well, you don't want to do that in graduate school because you'll never get a job. What you want to do is focus on a, an established discipline because then you'll find work in the academy. So I followed that advice and went into art history and quickly found out that um, I didn't want to be a, an art historian. Um, but so my, well, yeah, I guess the, the point of all that is um, don't be afraid to talk to your professors about anything at all in terms of ideas and how those ideas might apply in the world, um, as an advisor now, I'm most excited about um, finding out what individual students want and helping them along with that. I think that's what I missed is it, uh, in my um, graduate education. I, I didn't really know what I wanted, and so I uh, couldn't um, ask for it. So one of the things I'd like to do now is really, really try to figure out what the individuals are. I'm in the art department. We get everyone there is an individual with a capital I, um, <laughs> and figuring out um, how they're going to make their way in the complex world of, of art making is is really interesting. The more I know about them as people, not just as um, scholars or object makers, the the more. Um, fun it is to help them and match them things. So the the most satisfying um, advisor, advisee relationships I have now are with the people I, I know the most in all aspects of life. So I mean uh, and it's it, it's um it's a matter of um, of civility and a matter of, matter of conversation. And you don't you know it's someone who comes into the first meeting and wants to blurt out their whole life story it may not be the best way of proceeding. But like a gradual um, getting to know each other is I've got to be um, yeah, I want to piggyback on that. I, I totally agree. Um, I went to the University of Illinois Champaign Urbana for graduate school. Initially, for a master's degree in music. I have two degrees in music that most people don't know about. But, um, and then I worked at the university in um, the Office of Minority Food Affairs in the graduate college, and I was a recruiter, and we, as a student activist, we all put that office together. Then I started working there. And then I eventually got into a doctoral program in higher education there initially. Well, I stayed there. Um, but one of the things, the difficulties, or the challenges I should say I had, is both gender and race. I mean, like the program that I was admitted into, they only accepted 10 students, so it's a very selective program, right? So you go in and, and you know, and all of these male professors, they haven't really worked with them. Uh, and it's certainly not black women. And you know, they have these preconceived notions about you. Um, and so, in terms of advice, they're not going to advise me for certain kinds of things that they advise these other guys for, right? Um, and, uh, and it just so happened that in the history of education program uh, that was also on my floor, there was an African American professor. Uh, and he and I used to talk, because I had taken history courses. And subsequently, I went into history of it. Uh, but I was just telling him things that this advisor was telling me. Uh, you could get an EDD or a PhD. And he just said, oh, get an EDD. And not explain it to me, like, it's a big difference between having an EDD and a PhD. And he just said, oh, it doesn't matter. And then this guy said, well, ask him, why does he have a PhD? And if it doesn't matter, you know, <laughs> like, everybody's going to tell you. And so if I hadn't talked to this way, I would have had, you know, all of these lesser, I mean, uh, you know, and these kinds of things. And then, uh, when you go to take classes at that institution, some classes you can only get in with the permission of the professor. So you have to go to the professor and say, "Tell him why you want to be in this class." So um, I remember going to this guy, and um, and he didn't even know me. He's like, "Well, this is going to be a very difficult class." And, you know, just telling me, you know, already that I don't think you can do this, right? you have children? And asking all these stereotypical kinds of questions, like, what? And uh, anyway, I took the lesson, it wasn't even that difficult. And I just remember <laughs> him writing cubic on the board instead of public, you know. It was just a, you know, that was just the, the last. But anyway, um, one of the 
things. And then graduate students for sure help you out, you know, who've been there before and can tell you can sort of do this roadmap. But this is ancient history. This is like in the 70s. You know, so you know, there's been a lot of change and there are women on the faculty now and there are much more students of color. But I mean, at the time that I was there, it was just really sort of difficult. Uh, in terms of people to some people asking you, oh, this is a good paper, did you write it? You know, and you know, and these kinds of questions. So I mean, you know, so for the first year, you know, they, it was very clear that people had preconceived notions about the capabilities of women and people of color. Uh, but then things changed, and then my advisor left uh, to come actually to California for a job, and so I went over to history of it, and that's how I ended up doing history of higher education. So I do a combination of both, but I've taught in a variety of schools. Um, and I think it depends on the students and their backgrounds. Um, you know, I've talked, I mean, I've taught in places like Barnum, where, you know, it's a seven sister college, the kids are very elite and very sophisticated. Then I've taught like at Hunter College, which is enormous first generation students mm -hmm. and immigrant students and they feel intimidated. They don't know that they should talk to an advisor. You know, and so, and even here, you know, in different places, a few first generation, before I left Hunter and came here, one of my colleagues who used to teach at Yale and Princeton, and we were talking about comparing notes, because I also taught at Teachers College at Columbia, and I was still teaching at Barnett, and we were just talking about the difference in the students, and we were going to get this grant, which they got, but I left on working with working class students, because going to college is really a middle class experience. And if you're not, you don't know how to negotiate these offices. And when I talk like it, I just teach them. You know, students are full-time students because we fully fund everybody. And so they're always around. And they come to your office. You do get to know them and do things. And they, your research assistant, they work for you. But here, people come and go. And they come on certain days. And they don't have time to come to office hours. And really, they might catch you before or after class. Um, and so it's very different. So I get to know students very well in schools where students are full time and they have money. Um, and it's a very different uh, kind of experience. I, I, and I don't want to take it too much time. I had a student at Hunter. And students often don't come to class. You don't know why. You know, and then they challenge you great at the end. So this woman, <laughs> um, I said, I didn't even know you were still in my class. <laughs> you know, because I hadn't seen her. You know, and she said, oh, I was having family problems. And I said, well, why don't you come and talk to me? You know, I'm a professor, I'm not psychic. You know, um, <laughs> and she said, well, I don't feel like I have to tell my personal business. So, um, but, okay, so, well, and so, you know, that, that, I mean, you don't have to tell me blow by blow, but you could at least say I'm having family problems or personal problems. You don't have to say specifically what it is. But if I have no knowledge of why you're there, that makes a big difference. But I think it's important just, uh, you said, uh, getting to know students on a personal level because everybody's different. And I say to students too, you know, you have to make sure it's a good match with you and your advisor because it's almost like a marriage or a relationship. You know, and you have to feel like this person is like you're in your corner and is your agent and your advanced person, right? You know, and so if your advisor is not going to advocate for you then, uh, unless there's some obvious reason, you know, if you're not doing what it is they expect. But I think, you know, it has to be compatibility too with advisors. Um, and get to know them. I was talking to a student just recently, and she had done some things, and I said, well, why didn't you talk to me on your advisor? She said, well, I didn't want to bother you. You know, but it's my job, you know. I mean, I could have helped you. It was something she had applied for, unbeknownst to me, and she, I knew the people, you know. It was something I, you know, but she just didn't know. And it's just a lot of things people don't know. Um, and I think with students who come from huge universities where they don't see advisors, or you go to an office that's an advisor, and often they just tell you, here's a checklist, you need to take this, 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 and that. You know, which is different from having somebody being invested in your career and your life. Like, I know you, so I'll send you an announcement. Oh, I just saw this coming out. This might be something you might be interested in attending, or applying for, or going to, that kind of thing. But um, so those are just so uh, my initial thoughts. Thank you all. Um, so um, thank you for keeping it brief because we wanted to allow some time for the students to ask questions. So um, if anybody has questions for 
anybody specific or all of them?
Uh, so yeah, then you would just venture out. I mean, because there's a consortium and, and there are other people, you know. And actually, you came here for a reason, so it must have been something that attracted you to that environment. Yeah, I would. I mean, just to echo that, um, I give very specific advice since you're in my department, <laughs> etc. But in general. One, talk to the cohort. Right. Different advisors have different styles. Right. So if I would first say, hey, here's how I'm feeling. Should I take it this way? They're always five minutes late to my meetings. I, I think they don't like me. They're like, oh, just five? They're 15 minutes late to mine. <laughs> so first I would try to calibrate that and just see what's going on. Now maybe you've done that. You know, okay, um, there are problems. Then talk to the advisor. I mean, very often, Students' perceptions of what we do and why we're doing it are not always accurate. And sometimes they are very, very off. Oh, I heard you asked someone to do this. That must be because you don't like them. No, I put them on the publication because I want them to get a job. So sometimes there's just that. And give us the chance. <laughs> Can I get, I, let me give you an example. Okay, Edward. Ed, Edward here is in my intro American class just to welcome you, Edward. But one of the things that he would, I think, say that I do is I'm always telling people go to the writing center. It's an intro class. You need to be able to write. I'm in a discipline where you write, and you write, and you write, and you write. And one of the reasons I beat this in, and I tell them all the time, I write on your papers, because you know, I have weekly papers, I say go to the writing center. Please know that doesn't mean I'm sitting here picking you out, saying you're bad, da, 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 but everybody can improve and I want you to be successful. Well, one of the reasons I do that is that many years ago, I'm going to say many years ago, I had a student, a young woman who was a Latina, and I encouraged her to go to the writing center. Okay, I figure I'm doing my job trying to get her to get help. I find out later that she took that as a comment that I didn't think she belonged in graduate school and thought that it was because she was a Latina. And it was like, oh my god, I'm trying to help you. But what that taught me is how easy it is on all sides to hear something different that is being said. Okay, so. I bend over backwards now, and I'm going to ask Edward later to attest to this, but I do. I say, guys, I put this on a whole pile of papers, and it's because I want you to get better. Because I don't want anyone to come and take those comments <coughs> as being something other than what it genuinely is. Because I really want my students to be successful. And the last thing I ever want was to intimidate someone and have them walk away thinking, you don't think I'm any good because I'm a Latina. It's like, no. Um, but I learned from that because she later passed this on and I thought, oh my gosh, I have to change and really emphasize what I say to my students and keep saying, this is because, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Work with your faculty. And sometimes, you know, you may end up with somebody who's a jerk. I can't say there aren't those. Or just a mismatch. Yeah, right. or, yeah. <laughs> but, it's not a good thing. Yeah, but, you know, make sure that what you're perceiving, yeah, there may be a real significant disconnect. The other thing is people, students will challenge you. I mean, I love, this is my, one of my favorite examples. Mm -hmm. Again, from when I was fairly early here, I was teaching a class, and I, it was shortly after I came, and it was a class on women and politics, which I haven't been able to teach for a long time. I wish I could. Um, and I had a young African-American woman in the class, and I had students come to me and talk to me about the papers they're going to do, research papers. She came to me and she said, I'm going to write a paper on why black women hate white women. Kids and then you know, shiny place, shiny bright was my skin. You know, and it's like, and I'm sitting there thinking, and I said, okay, that's, that's pretty cool. Blanket though, right? I mean, right, right. I said, let's, you know, let's figure out how.
how to make it more specific and... Are there any moderators? She <laughs> 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 ended up with a great paper that ended up turning into her MA. She's now a long-term faculty member at a community college here who hires all kinds of my students for adjunct teaching and it doesn't matter what race they are. But, you know, it was like, oh my gosh. But you have to help students, you know, I, I had a student like that, you know, let me just say, I tell all my students to go to the Center. Good. I mean, because that's what it's here for. I mean, I yeah. went to Amherst, which is an elite college, and all of them had to take their patients to the writing center first, you know, just to make them better. It's not like you can't write. Right, 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 exactly, exactly. Um, but, you know, I had a student like that who said to me, I'm interested in black students' education. You know, and I said, fine, good. And then I was recommending that they take this other class in the course of the day on Latino students. It was like, I'm not interested in Latino. But what do you mean? You know how you get education? Like, I mean, you can't, you know, and so I had to help them work through that. You know, like, you can't have that kind of attitude, right? You know, because you're going to go to class and they're going to be Latino, they're not be white people, Asian, you know. You just got to know people across the board. And you can have a, area of focus on African American students or black students. But you gotta know about other people too, you know. Uh, I mean, what I think what we're saying is the same successful relational behaviors that can help in life can help here. Right. Try to yeah. take the other person's perspective, give them a chance, go in with high expectations, and really see it as a marriage. And I think the mismatch is dead on. It's very likely that maybe your advisor feels very uncomfortable. Like, I want to help her, we're not matching. And if, here's the one, when people switch away from us, the student is always terrified that we're going to take it like we just got done by her. No, we fully get that there are different. I work a lot with Dr. Bill Crano. We have different advising styles. If, if someone says, hey, look, Jay, you're always on me. You're a pain in my tail. I'm going to Bill. He's not going to bother me as much. I'd say, pretty smart move. I would do that too if I were you. So we, do, we understand some people like chocolate ice cream, some people like Rocky Road, and we don't get insulted if you sit with us and say, look, here's why I think I'd be better off there. We'll have nothing but affinity for you and respect that you came to us, and we'll wish you all the luck in the world. So sometimes that fear leads people to not talk to your advisor, to switch without telling. So just treat it like a good relationship where you want that good breakup and don't de Facebook friend them right away. <laughs> well, also, I often advise students to take a different advice. A lot of students <laughs> Still 
sometimes advising or still helping and mentoring. It doesn't right. end when they graduate. Right, exactly. I mean, can't get rid of them. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so because they see you as their mentor and their advisor. Um, yeah. But I had somebody who was telling me how they felt very intimidated by their advisor. Mm -hmm. They didn't feel like, you know, and I always feel like I, whenever I talk to this guy, I, I always end up feeling like he think I'm stupid. You know, and I don't feel like, you know, they don't look forward to talking to that person. Any other question? I have a simple but uh, confused question. Is that um, is there some uh, particular person assigned as our advisor, or in, uh, or any faculty in our department is available as our advisor? Who is Because it advisor? depends on what department yeah. you're in, how they yeah. serve, decide. Yeah. If you have a question, you can talk to the staff person in your department, your program coordinator, and they can help you know who you have right yeah, now. Yeah, so in, in the art department, you, everyone is just um, randomly assigned uh, one of the core faculty as their advisor for their very first meeting, and then they stick with that person until the student chooses um, his or her committee, and then the chair of the committee becomes your, your advisor. Okay. But we're a really promiscuous department, so you can get advice from <laughs> yeah. you know, like in education, they have this class, a pro seminar, and in that class, all of the faculty members at some point during the semester come and sort of, this is who we are, this is what we do, and we talk about our research and our background. So the students will have an opportunity to know us. Yeah. And, um, and so it'll be a face and a person not just the name on the paper. And then that will also help them as well. So I say, oh, you know, your work sounds interesting, or it sounds like somebody I would want to work with. Can I shift gears? Yeah. This is something I, I want to put out, too. Um, the other thing that your advisors, you know, we're most of what we're talking now is about the first year kind of logistics. And this stuff is really important. But particularly for those of you who are in a PhD program, and I don't know how many of you are, you want to begin fairly early on thinking about publishing and what you're going to have to do to eventually probably get a job. Most of the PhD students end up wanting academia, but anyhow, a job. And one of the things that is really important on that is publishing. Adjunct teaching, publishing. So. Start talking fairly early on with your faculty about those, how do I go about doing this? Do you have connections? Because you know, I've been here a long time, and so I've got connections at all of these sort of surrounding schools, every place imaginable. And I'm usually very helpful with American politics students, getting them adjunct teaching after they have their MA. But the other thing is, yeah, your faculty very likely are doing research. I, I can't oh speak for every program, but, and I know there are discipline differences, but collaborative research is becoming more and more important. So if your faculty have a project, yeah, and it interests you, you may not in the first year be ready to significantly contribute, but you might start thinking about, how can I get on a project? Um, yeah, something, maybe they've got some funding, maybe they've got a relationship with, you know, an ongoing project. I counted last night. I have published now with 42 students since I came here. Okay? Hello? Yeah, for a student, yeah, that opens the door. You know, when you go on the job market for an academic job, you know, I tell my students, you want to get on the long short list. And start thinking now in your first year, when you go for a job, the long short list is the list of applicants who any place is at least looking at closely. And how do you get on that? You have a decent dissertation, decent letters, teaching experience, and some kind of publication. Yeah? That's how you do it. It's, I'm sorry if it sounds very cynical, and I'm not asked saying that you should go do kiss ass or something with your faculty. Doesn't yeah. Work. No, it really doesn't. Um, but, yeah, if they're doing something interesting, you know, 
let them know that you might be someone who would like to participate. And maybe they have funding, maybe they don't. But, you know, it's, you know, have a long-term sense of where you're going and what kinds of things that you need to do to get there. You know, first year, hey, get through all the stuff you got to get through. Get your feet on the ground, make sure you got your classes, that, you know, that stuff in order. But then, start thinking about the next phase. At least, that's one of my thoughts. I want to piggyback on Jean's comment on no kiss ass yeah, behavior. Um, and it, yeah, to me, it's like they, to just be honest. Yeah. With the, yeah. There's nothing like an honest conversation with a student to find out where they are. So you don't need to try to impress the faculty member with your incredible wit and intelligence and, and insight. Because um, they're actually not looking to that kind of superficial impress by doesn't doesn't work. Just like be yourselves and tell them what you're interested in. If you don't know your interests, it's like part of their job is to help you figure out what they are. So be, be honest. Yeah, and just to quickly add, I, with, with the, whether it's PhD or a master's, I think the great advice is begin with the end in mind. I mean, to quote Stephen Covey, you know, right now you're in this whirlwind, but why did you come here? What do you want? When you leave, what do you want? It is a job, it is an academic job, and just ask your prop. What do I need to get there? Right. You know, so I think really just begin with the end in mind, remind yourself why you're here, and then ask the people who know the steps to take. And if you do that, if you, if you ask the right person what steps, uh, anyone accepted into CGU has the capabilities of taking those steps. Where people go wrong is they don't ask and they take the wrong steps. So remind yourself, why am I here? Where do I want to end? Find out the pipeline to get there and just kick you know, a lot of tail getting there. So I didn't ask them to talk about this, but um, in that brochure that you have, the multi-page brochure, if you flip to the first page, you'll see like some rainbow colored boxes. And in November, there's going to be a series of events that are around career um, planning. So that's a nice lead into the next series of events. And if you want to get a jump start on that, on the Career Development Office um, website, on the CG website, she has something that's called like essential documents or something like that on the left. And there's like, um, if you're not sure what you want to do, there's something you can take that's kind of an interest assessment. Even if you're sure what you want to do, it's kind of interesting to learn more about yourself, to be a little reflective there. Um, there's, uh, there's a mapping document, and there's some career exploration, there's some other resources. So um, uh, we have a few more minutes, and I had another question um, that I want to pose unless somebody else has a question. Um, but I think sometimes um, that it, it's, you know, begin with the end in mind and figure out what you want to do, um, and you're here and you know you want to get here, but how do you build that bridge? And so I think that you've spoken a lot about how the faculty can help, and you'll have a chance to speak with some of the other staff in a few minutes, but there are tools out there. So if you're saying, I, I want to do this, or I, I need to understand X, Y, and Z, but I don't know how to get there, I don't know what that means, I don't know... There may be some hard work, but I need somebody to hold my hand a bit or give me some references or resources. Those exist. You know, you're not the first first year class. There's you know a lot out there, and so um, so I think that the the notion of asking for help has um, not been undersold, and that um, you know that persists. So, but and I just want to also say from the dean of students office, um, my colleague Chris Bass, dean of students, and I, dean of student services. We also just want to make sure that you know who we are. We're a small institution with pretty much an open door policy. I mean, we do attend meetings, things like that, where obviously setting up an appointment ahead of time is always a good idea, but we also are here to help and maybe serve as a conduit to get you to the right resource or the right place. Um, so I do encourage you to stop by, see us, and I've had Really, it's an honor when, you know, I, I've heard some of the faculty say here, it's really an honor to get to know you, to get to know who our students are, who the faces are that make up our campus community. Because if you think about our, the constituents here, the campus community, the students are by far the largest number here on this campus compared to the number of faculty and staff. So you make the largest, you know, number of who our campus community members are and, and we'd really like to get to know you if, if 
um, especially when we're talking about the assistance that you may need. I don't know, Chris, if you want to chime in and, and say more. Sure. <laughs> um, well, let me just start by thanking the, the panel that we have here. And I think you're getting a lot of great information from kind of the, what I consider kind of the best of the best out there at, in the CG community. So I hope you appreciate the information that they've shared. I think each of them have given you little nuggets that you can take with you and incorporate. Um, but one thing I did want to mention specifically, and, and Jason mentioned it in his, his initial statement, was just a piece about um, those students who might need academic accommodations. I think that's really important. And I'm great. And I love the way he kind of framed it with the, the, the analogy with glasses or the analogy with the, the broken leg. It's really just a tool to help in, as part of your success. So, so utilize that tool. Um, the other piece, I think, and as they've all shared, is, is the piece about just communication um, and just communicate with them and let them know if it's as much as you feel comfortable sharing about your personal situation, um, but specifically communicate with them about your academic side, and really just asking the right questions to get the information that you need. Because I think all of them, um, and all of the faculty, I think writ large here, want to get you to the finish line. And, and so as much as many questions as you ask, the more position or the better position you are to get to the finish line. So. I want to thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, um, I I read the emails that CGU sends out and uh, <laughs> like the announcements and um, if like for like academic advising, like the Career Development Office is having like a landing an academic academic like job conference or something tomorrow. So um, like if you guys are interested, like I still have like my timelines like longer, so I'm like I'll go next year kind of thing, but. You know, um, Christine Kelly's like really good with kind of like mapping out your career, and she's she's also like an advocate of if you're not going into academia, then here are your options. And so, like I went to a couple of her events, and I think they're really good. So. And here she is. is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what time is it tomorrow? And where uh, is it? it uh, the conference. I was just talking about the conference tomorrow. Um, it's all day. It's all day. Uh, it's, 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 yes. It starts at 9 with our keynote speaker, and it goes until 4. I think some of you are registered, but if you're not, it's over in Berkeley. So if you do want to pop in on it at this late date, we won't be able to offer you a lunch unless you're already registered, but there will still be some seats available. And that kind of goes with the keep the end goal in mind. I really love also what you said about that, that if you're coming in here, and that's one of the reasons why if you're a new student this year and you attended new student orientation, you heard a whole presentation from Career Development Office from Christine Kelly, because that's what, you know, it's so important. Many students leave that to the very end. I'll worry about that until my last semester thinking about what kind of job. And that's waiting just too far, especially if you're in a master's program. Right, that's putting it off, and, and that master's program will go by so quickly. So I really appreciated also what you said about that, is keep the end goal in mind, but start acting on it now. And there are various resources, um, so aside from your faculty, also uh, the Career Development Office uh, at CGU, or the, even the Career Development Office for Drucker students over at uh, the Drucker School. What do you think? When I finished my doctorate, <coughs> I did a postdoc, but it was really interesting. Nobody that I've worked with ever mentioned postdoc to me. I gave a paper at a conference. And this woman came up to me and said, oh, this is going to be great research, and what are you going to do with it? And I don't know. You know, and she said, oh, you know, well, you know, there's this postdoctoral program at Radcliffe, this research uh, center for research on women. You know, and I, if she had told me that, I mean, it literally changed my life because that really started put me on this road to continue the work I did. But no, none of my professors had ever mentioned postdoc to me at all, uh, or anything else that thing. But um, it was interesting. Uh, I have one little thing I can add that would help with that. Um, I'm currently the
process of creating an academic career roadmap that uh -huh. has a whole bunch of stuff that you need to do. And one of the things that's listed in there is do you need a postdoc? Mm -hmm. And we'll have resources on that. So if some of you are thinking about doing an academic career, we're hoping to have that. I don't think it'll be done by tomorrow, but it'll be done by um, sometime next week. Uh, and we'll work through it. But it's a rifle PDF, and it leads you through all of the things that you need to do to become prepared, starting from your very first year in graduate school and all the things you would need to do to make sure that you're very strong by the time you finish. And I just have one last question for the panel. Um, I'm just kind of the fill in the blank, if you will, that, you know, the the ideal advisee is, if you could choose one word to fill that in, I'll, I'll challenge each of you if you could pick a different word, that'd be helpful. Um, so, whoever wants to start, because if you start soon, you get the multitude of Well, my advice, ideal advice, is somebody who is not afraid or intimidated to come talk to you. You know, a lot of people are. Um, and it is getting to know people, and it just depends on people's background. Some people are not used to talking about things. You know, like when we say, I don't have to tell you my personal business, but I've been in other, I mean, I can't even tell you some of the stuff other students have done. You know, <laughs> uh, but you know, it's just different, <laughs> right, from what he thinks to the others, like too much information, you know, but, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, there are some things, you know, just basic getting to know you, what's your background, where'd you go to school before, where are you from, and you know, you know, just trying to get a sense of the person. Uh, and of course, what are your career goals, what are your aspirations, why are you here, what you want to do, that kind of thing. Uh, my single adjective would be curious. That's all, just that curiosity. I'm going to go with four words. Um, if you've seen Jerry Maguire, basically help us help you. <laughs> the ideal advisee will give me the knowledge and power to help them. <clears throat> And if you don't give that to us, it's very hard. So just trust us. We are here to help you. Come to us and then let us do that. That's like three words. Help us. <laughs> I don't do math. <laughs> it's hard to do one word, but I think I'm going to say that I want just who have certain academic skills and so on, but people with integrity. Because if you don't have integrity, um, you, know, you, you will not, you will mess up, and you will mess up in ways um, that damage the relationships. And if, if you do not, this, if an advisee is dishonest or lies, yeah, the faculty will probably find that out. But you're going to need that person down the road. Um, yeah, so I think it's integrity. I mean, and I think you have a right to expect integrity from your faculty yeah. and from the university. So it's not a one way street. So I think, yeah. So that's my word. It's very important. Thank you. 